We're sitting down with Randy Funk, who is a guy who I know from my previous life as a newspaper reporter. He was in one of the, the last season's play at Theater Phoenix up in the Belmar Mall, K2, I believe with Eric Baker. And I uh, Eric Baker directed it and Eric Nelson was my co-star. Okay, so those double Eric's. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, they became Biggie and Little E as we were doing this. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you want to just uh, talk a little bit, Randy, we are going to get to what you've been doing most recently, but we'll build the suspense by having you talk a little bit about uh, your life before MSU, if there was such a thing, and then <laughs> your experiences that you uh, that you carry with you from yeah. your time at MSU, including when that was. You, we were talking a little bit. It looks like it must have been the late... 1990s because the Andreas Theater was just kind of yeah. on the cusp. Yeah, it was mid 90s actually. Um, I went. I started there fall of 1994. Um, I was a little older. I was 24 at the time that I went there because um, I had. Oh, I was one of those kids that was just not ready to go to college. And uh, I tried community college and it was an on and off, mostly off thing. And I finally decided that all right, 24. I'm ready to do this. Time to time to get going. And um, I had a friend uh, named Cedric Yarbrough who was at Mankato, and he spoke very highly of the theater department. So I thought this is close enough. This is local, and and they've got a good theater department. I should do this. And um, so I went down to Mankato. So it was '94, and I finished in spring of '97. So it was kind of two and. A little more years. <laughs> so. Okay, so you had that community college uh, mm -hmm. that transferred over for you. Okay, yeah, you mentioned Cedar Key, of course, is one of those names that that we, when I was there working for the department, we always brought up as one of our success stories with Reno nine one one and uh, the Fockers movie. Wasn't he in that one? Yeah, uh, he was in. He was in one of those, and he was also on the show uh, Speechless for a couple of years. So that's right. Uh, so yeah, Cedric has done and done great things. So. Uh, you knew him from high school or from uh, just... from a kind of a there's a small community theater up there called Shakespeare and Company that um, we had mutual friends who were performing in the shows and I was performing as well Cedric just sort of came along and you know he was he's an outgoing guy he was everybody's age so we all sort of hung around together and then the next summer Cedric actually did Shakespeare and Company and that mm -hmm. so um, so yeah kind of through that association and and you know, one of those serendipitous things, he sort of came along as a friend at a point in time where I really was trying to figure out what to do next. And so, again, when he spoke of Mankato, I thought, yep, that's the place for me. Let's do that. So, okay, well, had you done theater in high school or in community? You said yeah. that fear thing. So you evidently were looking for that as because you knew it was going to be something I could make a lot of money in and be successful and retire <laughs> early, right? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, I knew I was interested in a variety of things about theater. Um, yeah, I had performed in high school and um, I also had done a lot of writing. And so it just seemed like a space that I could um, I could perform, I could write. Um, I discovered that I enjoyed directing and that. So that's kind of what I went with. And um, so, yeah, it, it was, as I said, it was an on and off thing. I did community college theater and I had a really great group of friends and, and they were fantastic. It was, uh, it was Lakewood Community College at the time in White Bear Lake, it's Century College now, but, okay. um, but it was, I, as I said, I went there on and off. There, was, there just came a point in time where I was showing up there to do the plays and go to lunch and hang out with my friends, but not maybe study as much. So um, just those lost years and that. It was much different when I went to Mankato. So not that I didn't hang out and, and have lunch, but I was a little more diligent about the studying. So. Okay, what, were, what are your first experiences or memories of being involved in a theater production or the theater department? Uh, I was in Richard III. Um, I had kind of a weird introduction to it. I got down there and didn't really know what to do. I missed the first theater meeting. And so I, and I had already signed up for classes that were not theater classes and that. And so I got a letter from the department that said, um, you're listed as a theater major, but we have no knowledge of you. If this is a mistake, please correct it. If not, please come in and see Dr. Hustles immediately. And so I went in and saw Dr. Hustles immediately and he seemed a little flabbergasted that I was there. And he said, you know, we send these letters out all the time. I think you're maybe the second person to have ever actually walked into my office. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So I had sort of a weird introduction, but it was good because he was able to sort of guide me towards things. And 
Um, I auditioned for Richard III. I got uh, to play Richmond in that. Uh, Eric Baker playing Richard III, directed by Dr. Uh, Olasson. And um, it was a great introduction to the department, as I remember. So really, I started kind of with winter quarter at the time. Okay. And um, it, was, it was one of those great experiences because you got those occasional shows on the main stage where it was big enough that it felt like everybody in the theater department was in it. So it was a great way to get introduced to practically everybody in the theater department because they were either in the show or working on the show backstage. Um, and it was, it was really wonderful. I, I just, as a, I had a friend of mine come down from a uh, community college and he saw the show and the first words out of his mouth were, this is what college theater should look like. Um, and I thought it again. It just confirmed that I was in the right place. So, yeah, and and it's it's interesting that you say they sent you a letter because of <laughs> nowadays you would never see paper. No, <laughs> it would come through an email, maybe yeah. a phone call if there was a follow up or something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, times yeah. they have a change oh, quite gosh. a bit yep. in that sort of thing. So, uh, how did how did your year proceed after Richard? Oh, it was, well, Richard was, the, the one hang up with it was that I had uh, um, the big climactic battle with Richard and Richmond. Um, one night, my foot got caught on something as Eric, who was a pretty thick guy about my height, fell into me as I was killing him, and my knee buckled under me, and I, yeah, it wound up being a, a pretty bad knee injury, um, and so I was able to get through the show. And then I had to do K2, which, if you recall, it's two guys on a mountain doing mountain climbing stuff. So we were yeah. climbing all over the, the black box space that we did it in. So I had to have surgery on my knee right after Richard III closed. Then I had three weeks of daily rehab after that while I'm doing K2 at the same time. And fortunately, they rehabbed my knee enough to where I could actually do the climbing and everything. But um and it was funny because Eric, my, my co-star in it, uh, Eric Nelson, plays a guy who's got a compound fracture of his leg. So Eric barely ever moves, but he's perfectly healthy. I have to do all the climbing in my, I've got the bum knee. So <laughs> somehow we made it work. But it was, it was a great experience. Eric's a terrific actor. And it was, uh, and Eric Baker did such a great job directing. It was a really emotional show. And um, I had a great time doing it. It was, it was that Richard III and, and K2, it's were such great experiences it really kind of it set the tone for the whole rest of the time at Mankato it was really wonderful so. all right uh yeah the theater phoenix for those who don't know was a little storefront basically in <laughs> Belmar Mall right across yep. the, the hallway from the bingo parlor oh gosh that's right I forgot about that yeah so it was always fun if you were on break or something you'd go out and hear somebody call bingo <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> I remember that, yeah. It yeah was. And, and it had a it had a lobby that was probably what about uh, ten by ten, if that. Yeah. And then you just entered the the theater space in back, and I don't think there was much for a costume, or a dressing room, or anything else there. You basically were out in the back door. Yeah, there were there were two incredibly thin dressing rooms that that looked like they probably had been tool sheds once or something like that um, that went to a shared bathroom at the end. And um, it was fine when we were doing K2 because it was just me and Eric. Um, but when we did um, almost any other show, I think the next two shows I did there had casts of 10 or 11, you know, you'd be sitting there trying to put your makeup on and your costumes as you're cramped into the space and everything. And um, I remember uh, one of the grad students, right before K2, I think the show that they did in February was called um, The Dufa, which was a, uh, an Africanized translation of an ancient uh, Greek play. And so it was because it was set in Africa, the costumes were very light and flowy and that sort of thing. And meantime, we're doing K2, which is set on a, a mountain. So we have parkas and everything. Well, we were doing this in April. <laughs> when, <laughs> so I remember Mark Withers, one of the grad students saying, Hey, you know, that's great timing. You get time. We're doing a dufa. Everybody's freezing, gathered around a space heater and back. Meantime, in April, when we're doing the play, I, we were on stage during intermission and laying on stage and I would lift my head up and see a pool of my sweat where my head had been. So <laughs> it, the conditions could get pretty primitive in there sometimes. So. Yeah, but it, it was a great experience. It allowed you to be prepared for what you would find in, in the real world with small theaters and 
it was much closer to that experience than almost anything else I ran across. So yeah, absolutely great preparation for that. Yeah, if you, if you go to the Andreas Theater today and are in a studio production, you have two you know hall or stairways that go down to the dressing rooms that are also used for the main stage productions, yeah. a green room with leather sofas and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, kids, I'm so bitter. I, <laughs> I'm glad for them, but I'm so bitter. <laughs> well, so uh, were there any other shows that you did that that really stand out for you at MSU, and what were the experiences that you had maybe? off stage you know behind the scenes or oh gosh um I, I had a lot i did a lot of shows that were that were really good i did um a show in the phoenix called the shadow box which is which is wonderful uh susan rapidu was the director and she was she was terrific and i got to work with her again a year later in a phoenix show that was her um, um her thesis project um mm -hmm. death and the maiden which was also a great show um i got to play sherlock holmes uh mm -hmm. in a play which was a dream role of mine so that was that was phenomenal and my good friend joe fellman played watson and so it was it was wonderful because joe and i had sort of a personal chemistry to begin with so there was so much of the sherlock watson relationship that we didn't have to recreate because it was just there to begin with um i got to do sweeney todd which was a wonderful play and still i think the only musical i've done post high school so um it's sort of that fun thing I get to tell people. It's like, oh yeah, I've only done one musical with Sweeney Todd. And they'll go, so the one musical you've ever done was Santa? <laughs> like, you know, was, was that with Cedric as Sweeney? As Sweeney, yeah. yes. Yeah, that was that was terrific. Yeah, which is, again, the fun part when my son would sit down and watch Speechless with me because he enjoyed the show. I would invariably, when Cedric would come on, I'd point and go, yeah, that guy killed me once on stage. You know? <laughs> and let's see, Julie Powers? Uh, yes, Julie Powers was uh, was Mrs. Lovett. Um, oh gosh, I'd be embarrassed if I can't remember most of the cast. I, if I see, I'm getting to that age where it's like, yeah. oh yeah, you were the in the. Okay, yes, okay, I remember that. But um, actually, I have some photo. Well, I have some photos of Cedric. I think there might be a couple from Sweeney Todd okay. on there. So if you, if you get the chance, go to my Facebook page and oh, yeah, and, and yeah. check it out. I, I I feel bad because I I loved doing the uh, production photos when I was at MSU. And as part of my time there, we went through the slides that used to be done for photo. I mean, protocol used to be 24 photos because oh. it was slide photography and very expensive. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you got it, great. If you didn't, you had a blurry photo of this show <laughs> for eternity, but we scanned yep. all those in. I found I still have some because I did some work at home but I'll take a look and see what I've got and share with you if I, if I find anything. Oh. oh yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. That was, again, that was another one of those shows where it was, it was so much fun because it seemed like everybody in the department was in it in one capacity or another. And, um, and audiences, really, we weren't sure because the play, the material is so dark, we weren't sure what audiences were going to think of it, but uh, they seemed to love it. We got standing ovations every night and, and, um, as nerve wracking an experience as it was for me, because I hated to sing. <laughs> so, I had, well, it, and that, that ultimately was a really valuable experience. And I think that's one of the things that was valuable for Mankato was consistently time and again, getting out of my comfort zone and discovering new things. And that's, um, that was incredibly valuable. You can't put a price on that. It was fantastic. So. Well, and I think the environment where you're supported by so many people that you know from class and from outside of class you're not going to have that kind of support in most situations. No, absolutely. It was, I mean, there was a real, I guess, kind of synergy that was there. It was just an exciting place to be. And it didn't matter if I was working on a main stage show or if I was directing a, a project for a directing class or something like that. There was just, it, I would always be excited going into to things that I was working on. And so it, um, yeah, my, my memories of it are really, overwhelmingly positive yeah there were a lot of mornings where i woke up going oh my god i've got so many things to do today what am i gonna do you know but um but also i've gone back to school the last couple of years and that has i i think mankato was great preparation for that and and it really taught me discipline and and prioritizing and and like i said getting out of your comfort zone and trying things and and i will always be grateful for that experience Okay. What other ways or how did you utilize the MSU 
education when you went out into the world as what would have been about a 27 year old? Yeah, yeah, I was 27. Um, it uh, again, it, it, again, with that discipline, it taught me that. Um, it gave me some experience writing for the stage, which I hadn't done that before. We did a couple of, uh, I don't even know if they still have them. They were called ETCs. You just basically yeah. book the book a space and, and do a show. Um, and uh, I got to write a couple of those. And it, it, I've said with my writing now, one of the most valuable things was doing theater taught me how to write dialogue because as an actor, you know what sounds good to the ear and what feels good in the mouth. And so you, you write that way. And um, if I hadn't had that opportunity, and Mankato really presented me with so many opportunities to do things like that, that um, it was just incredibly valuable. Even if, even there, there were a lot of things I wrote, scenes and maybe short plays that never made it to the stage, but I would show them to a friend of mine and I would get response and feedback on it. And so I took that with me. Um, it also gave me my first opportunities to direct really. And so uh, learning how to work with actors and create stage picture and things like that. Um, I started my own theater company a couple years after I graduated called uh, Pig's Eye Theater. And we had that going for about five or six years, but so much of, of what I learned from directing and writing and acting at Mankato served me well during that time there. So, um, yeah, there were a lot of takeaways I had from that. Would you have had the opportunity to be in a like a theater management class or something that helped I you? I did. Out? Yeah, I did. Um, it was uh, <laughs> one of my favorite stories from Mankato, and I'll try not to go too far off the beaten path with this. Um, when I was doing K2, I explained to you all, all the stuff that I had going on in my life to begin with. Um, one of the consequences of that was that we started spring quarter which is when I had the theater management class and spring quarter was always kind of weird because it was the shortest break that you would have, you know, you'd have a whole summer before fall quarter, you'd have about a month of winter break before winter yeah. quarter. spring break, you had a week and a half and boom, you're right back at it. And so I had all these other things going on and we finished K2 after two weeks. And then I had this really horrible cold that took me out of commission for about a week. And so now the quarter's half over and I'm like, okay, now I'm ready to start spring quarter. By this time I've missed so many classes and assignments that I'm in, I'm in trouble in theater management. So I took the midterm, Dr. Hustles brought me in uh, because I did badly on the midterm. And he said, well, the bad news is you're failing in the class right now. The good news is if you really apply yourself for the second half of this class and get straight A's, I think you can at least pull out a C in the class. I thought, yeah, I can take on that challenge. And so I did. I wound up getting a C in the class, which is still one of my proudest accomplishments because I dug such a deep hole for myself to get out of it. But um, but yeah, sorry. Anyway, off the beaten path. That was, yeah, the theater management class was valuable for learning how to do the business side of things, organizational structure, things like that, stuff that certainly does not come naturally to somebody like me. Um, so to have that exposure to see how, and I remember him having an organizational, Dr. Hustles having an organizational flow chart and that sort of thing that in my mind, I would always refer back to when we were getting the theater company going. So that was, yeah, learning that side of the business was really valuable. Okay, and how did Pig's Eye end? Was it just kind of it run its course or? Yeah, it just run its course. It's really hard to run a small theater company. Um, you're on a shoestring budget. You're not really making enough money to sustain it. So what's happening constantly is that the people involved are putting their own money into it. Plus you put so much of your time and effort into it. And I think there's, for small theater companies, a lot of times there's sort of an arc that you go in. And the hard part is recognizing when you're on the downside of the arc and it's like, okay, we're, this is just diminishing returns at this point. Um, and the couple of things uh, that happened as Pig's Eye was sort of winding down, we had lost a lot of board members. We had a lot of good actors that had worked for us that either just moved on to other things or unfortunately didn't want to work with us again because, you know, just stuff happens. And um, plus uh, my ex-wife and I, uh, well, she was my wife at the time, uh, we, we, had our, we had our son and it just changes your priorities in life. And... Um, as it happened, that's when I took up mystery writing again. So once you've discovered another creative outlet, it's hard to go back to this other thing that is such a struggle to begin with. And so, yeah, it's, that's a long way of saying it just ran its course. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you were spending 
countless hours doing that and taking oh, away from other things. And um, yeah. it was it was kind of destructive from the inside out, probably. It is. Yeah. It's just it's like having another child. And when you have an actual child, then you don't have time for that child anymore. <laughs> and yeah, it's again, like make it it's a valuable experience. I didn't look back on it as a failure or anything like that. It put me in contact with so many people that I'm still really good friends with today. And it, it got my name out there and I got to work with people I might not have otherwise. So it was yeah, it was it was a great experience, but it was time when it was done. It was time. OK. And did you. From there, did you go into a, a writing aspect or did you do any more acting at that point? Or what was well, I've done, yeah, I mean, I've stuck with acting here and there. Um, I did, uh, basically the transition was, I wasn't gonna audition for shows anymore, but if somebody wanted to call me up and ask me to do a show and I had time to do it, I would do that. Okay. So um, I had a friend of mine, Zach Curtis, who ran uh, the Paul Bunyan Playhouse, the Summer Sock Theater in Bemidji for, uh, the better part of 10 years and I think I was up there at least once a summer while he was doing that um, and he would use me in other shows uh, and that I have a friend of mine named Joe Papke who runs a small theater company called Classical Actors Ensemble. Joe would call me up and ask me to do shows and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken it's been three years since I did a show now um, just because I started school again and then there was no time to do plays at that point so um, and sitting here right now I honestly don't know if I will ever act again I'm you know I'm at that age where it's like well you know 51 how many good roles are there out there that I know of that I really want to play anymore do I really want to just show up and be the dad in the show with four scenes or something like that is that worth my time that kind of thing so yeah. i love theater but yeah i know i don't want to you never say never but it's right. been a while and i think it's going to be a while longer before i do another one okay well that's okay because your your tide has turned um more heavily toward writing and uh, I'll, I'll admit i've only read the first of your books that's all I, right I, I mean to keep going back and <laughs> And picking up the other ones because I, right. I have a ready contact for those. So uh, okay. why don't you talk a little bit about how you gotten into this? Because sure. it is now turned into a series of books mm -hmm. uh, with, yep. with the same lead character, I believe. Yep. And yeah, just tell us a little bit yep. about. Sure. Um, well, the book series is it's the Joe Davis Mysteries. And uh, there's seven regular books and one uh, collection of short stories in it. Um, I published them myself. I started my own uh, publishing company, Ghostlight Press, because apparently I just didn't have enough DIY in my life at that point. So I had to do something else. <laughs> but, um, so I, I, I wrote mystery stories when I was in high school. Joe was my main character in a lot of those. Oh. And um, uh, at some point or another, I just sort of stopped writing mysteries and I wrote other things. Again, I was in theater, so I liked writing plays and, and stuff like that. And um, I had an idea, oh, let's see, I was 34, so probably about 2004. I just had an idea for a mystery book, which didn't strike me as being unusual. It was just an idea that I had among many other ideas. And I sat down and I started outlining this idea. And the only way I've ever been able to describe it is that it just felt like coming home after a long time in the wilderness. Like this is, it felt like this is what I should be doing. This is what I always should have been doing. Um, and so at that point, again, that's where the theater company died because at that point this had all of my creative focus. Um, and so I, I started kind of writing a little bit. I took a couple of classes through the Loft uh, Literary Center here in Minneapolis, yeah. uh, wonderful classes. And I met uh, a published mystery author named Ellen Hart, who, uh, Ellen is a teacher. She's written, God, it's gotta be close to 30 mystery novels now. Um, she's, yeah, she's a great writer and a really good mentor. And she was the first one to tell me, this is really good. You could be a published author, you know, and she was being straight with me, I know she was. And um, it's a tough road to hoe trying to get published, especially now through a traditional publishing company, because, you know, you submit something and it's like, OK, is this like Harry Potter? Is this like the Hunger Games? Is this, you know, everything is it's such a small market and it's, it's getting smaller and tighter yeah. um, among traditional publishers. So I spent I finished 
the first book, the Joe Davis book in like 2011 and spent two years sending out query letters to various small publishers and agents and uh, got nothing back ever. Um, I had one small press that was interested in publishing my book and I had a meeting with them and the meeting did not go well. And I just thought, no. Um, so I decided what I wanted more than anything else is I want an outlet for these. I want, I want to do this myself. And certainly in a world where we have Amazon and, and so many uh, ebook publishing platforms now where it's, it's more, uh, you know, with the internet, it's easier to, um, to market your work now than it would have been 20 or 30 years ago. Sure. Um, and so I thought, let's, let's do this. Let's take a chance on this. And so uh, I continue to write the books, not only because it's such a, a great creative outlet for me and I need that, but in my mind, I'm selling a whole series. So if you read the first one or you read any one of them in there and you like it, hey, I got plenty more. You know? <laughs> so, so I'm producing product that way. And they are all individual stories. It's not uh, essential to, to read them in order. No, it's not. I mean, if you're a completist like me, I'm one of these people who likes to go back and read the first story and go ahead. But I do. Yeah, in my mind, each one of the books, you could you could pick it up. You don't have to have read the other books. There might be little references back to something from an earlier book. But ideally, that just makes you more intrigued to go back and read that book. Um, so, yeah, any one of them could be could be picked up and and be a starting point for for somebody. Yeah, you don't want to become self-referential like Stephen King. I just no. read the latest book, and he no. refers to the Overlook Hotel that burned down, of course, yeah. in The Shining, and yep. he refers to other characters and events that happened there. He's created his own world uh, over yeah. 50 years or how oh, long. Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But, uh, so how has Joe evolved through this seven-book series? How has he gotten wiser or is he um, as he ever was or <laughs> <laughs> he's um the character evolves a little bit just as i get to write him a little more um because it's funny i didn't know a lot about joe when i started writing the series i just know i had an idea for a guy who does this he's a he's a humor blogger that works for um it's called the daily bugle the way i well the city pages is no more but the way i used to put it was if an independent paper like the city pages had just become a website that's essentially what the daily bugle is and joe writes his own column for it and um but that was really all i knew about him and that he had this group of friends and and here was your starting point for the first book and let's roll um so i didn't know anything about his background i didn't know anything about him and so i've gotten to know more things about that as I went along. I've started to develop that and sort of integrate it into the into the little universe of, of Joe Davis. And um, in the in the books, in my mind, each one takes place a couple months after the previous one. So even though we're seven books into it, Joe's really only actually aged about two years, not even quite in this. So he's but what's sort of happening with him I think if what I'm, what's in my head is getting across on the page. Um, somebody asked me once why I, he, Joe was 33 in the first book and somebody asked me once why 33? And I thought about it for a second and I said, well, it's because when you're 33, it seems like an age where you're right on the cusp between one of two things. You're, you've been around the block a little bit. You're not a kid anymore. But at the same time, you're still kind of at the tail end of that point where your life can sort of revolve around hanging out with your friends and having your your weekly activities and things like that. And you can live a single sort of carefree lifestyle. But as we're going now, Joe is going to be 35 in the new book. He's starting to push that a little bit and he's starting to you're starting to get moments where he wonders, geez, am I gonna be doing this for the rest of my life? <laughs> kind of thing. Like, you know, is this is this been, you know, I'm 35 now. This is almost middle age to a degree, you know. So how do I, you know, is is this beneath my dignity to be doing things like this? So it's um it's subtle. It's not like I put it way out in front, but I've I've got some plans for future books that we'll start to explore that a little more. So I think that's kind of how he evolves a little bit as we okay. go. Have you been able to work out things in Randy's life, or excuse me, Randall J. Funk <laughs> life as you've been writing these books? Has, have they been 
therapeutic for you in any way? Very much so. Um, I, um, there's things that I've been through. I went through a divorce a couple of years ago. Um, I lost my mom last year. So these are hard things to deal with. And it was funny because I was talking to somebody just the other day. Uh, and I said, it's, you go through this weird thing, maybe as a writer, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But um, when my wife and I first split up, um, I didn't write anything for a week. I just, I thought, oh, forget it. I don't have the mental headspace to do a thing like that. And I started to, after about a week, I was just sitting, my son had a karate class. So all I had to do is just sit around and watch him be a karate at that point. So I would bring a notebook or a book. And so I brought a notebook and I started working again on one of the Joe Davis books. And I remember just putting my head down on the notebook, so grateful that I could do this again and suddenly realize like, why did I think I had to be in a certain headspace to write? Writing is like my salvation. This is the thing I need to do constantly. So um, that's why I always find time. People, you know, I talk about how busy my life has been the last couple of years with school and everything. And uh, people are surprised and I'm still able to put out books. And I'm like, I will always set aside time during the day to do that. It keeps me sane. I have to do it. So, you know, so yeah, that's, yeah, it's been it's been that evolution for me to to realize how important this is to me and, and to to give myself space to do it. Well, and I think that's just it. You, you talk about it's it's something that's important to you. You find or you make the time for it, whether Absolutely. it be exercise, travel, um, music, whatever it is in your life. Absolutely. Has Absolutely. that kind of compelled you and led you toward? You were talking about uh, wanting to teach English at the at the community college level? Are you wanting to pass that knowledge and awareness on to other people? Absolutely, you hit that right on the head because um, one of my classes that I'm taking right now for graduate school, an assignment that we had was to write about our own literacy journey, like how writing has been, uh, has affected us over time and how it's evolved and things like that. And I so said the best way I could describe it is that writing has always been my constant companion. It's always been there with me and been this thing. And so, now, in terms of, of teaching, that's how I put it was I want to be able to pass that on and pass it forward because it's been such a great companion to me. I want it to be a great companion to somebody else. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. That is one of my, one of my reasons I want to teach. So. And what kind of timeline are you, are you, if you put yourself under a timeline or with the completion of your degree, you'll be yeah. able to move forward? Yeah, I've started, uh, I started grad school, um, just a couple months ago in August. And so the pace I've set for myself is by spring of 2023, I want to have completed that program because that coincidentally is the date when my son will graduate from high school. <laughs> I have to wrap my head around that still. Um, but it, it, it's one of those where, uh, you know, ideally now you can do it. I've, I've had so many teachers at Arizona State where I go to school who, don't live in Arizona. They live in Laramie, Wyoming or Portland, Oregon or something like that. And they're still able to, to teach. And that would be ideal if I could still stay in Minnesota and teach wherever. But if I have to go someplace else and, and move someplace else to do that, well, I guess my son being graduated from high school and kind of starting his own life makes that a little, a little more palatable for me. I can do it then, I think so. Okay. Well, uh, Boy, this has been a great conversation. You know, yeah, you and I run across each other every once in a while. We went to see a, a mutual friend, Rob Kruger, in a play and yeah. ended up in the lobby together and and, yeah. and chatted as awkward Facebook friends do. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, what do you see as, uh, well, what do you hope for your son? I mean, uh, is, oh, is he has he got that kind of uh, spirit that you do, that creative spirit? And he He does. He's got... A rare and special brain. He is one of these people who he has a creative side to him. He also has a detail oriented side to him. So he can do English, he can do math science, he can, oh. uh, he can draw diagrams of things he writes. And I've seen him, he has great facility as a writer. Um, but it's such a, it's such a rare thing to have somebody who is both creative and a detail person. Most people are one or the other. And so I don't know that he's, he will write like me. I don't know that he's necessarily ever going to make it a career. He just enjoys doing it. But 
he's one of these people who could he could design engines he could be an architect he could you know he could create infrastructure you know it's it's a he's an incredibly creative individual but he's somebody who could go into um again he could say he's somebody who could go into uh not just the arts but something that is equally creative i mean architecture infrastructure engineering these are all creative endeavors um but you have to know your math science to do it and he's got that sort of brain so he's we all say this of our kids but he's got the capacity and the potential to do far more than what I've done. I love my books. I'm very proud of them. But he's one of his teachers once said he could be one of these kids who changes the world. And I'm like, yeah, he could be. Um, and so <laughs> it's it's a huge responsibility of for him to have to bear that. And it's a huge responsibility for me and my my ex to have to nurture that. But we do our best. So well, and the thing is right now with the with this, you know, I'll call it a post-COVID world, uh, we things are changing in ways that we could not have predicted pre-COVID. Oh, oh, so yeah. being that kind of creative guy who can not only probably recognize these things, but also find a way to to work within it, he's the you know, the sky's the limit for what he can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's uh it's nice. The future is very bright for him, I think. So, and that's exciting to see. So. And speaking of bright futures, you led me right into my my concluding question. <laughs> uh, maybe something for the current MSU theater student. If you can think back to yourself being oh. that person in the mid '90s, what would you suggest or urge them to do during their college theater days to help prepare them for the post? college world just a small question okay yeah just just not yeah um no way. yeah here is the thing this is this is one of my great takeaways now kind of sitting on the other side of things is be honest with yourself number one just be honest with yourself that's a hard enough thing to do anyway be honest with yourself about how you're going to approach this career and what you're willing to do I could have made a career in theater if I had decided the next thing I wanted to do was to go to grad school for theater. And then after that, be, to be a working actor would mean my mom's house would be my permanent address and I would be traveling all over the country. Oh, I'm, in Arizona, I'm in Oregon for these couple of months. I'm in Georgia for these couple of months. I'm in New York for these couple of months. And I had to be honest with myself after a time and go, I'm not willing to do that. That's, that's not, that's not, what I wanted to do. Starting a theater company, that's a little closer to that. Do I want to teach? Would that make me happy? Um, I see people who are in theater right now that I'm that I say to myself sometimes, you should be teaching theater to kids coming up because that would be perfect for you, not running this theater company that you're doing right now or something like that. It's it's find your niche, find what makes you happy, be honest with yourself about what sacrifices you are willing to make and what things you are really willing to do. And if you're only willing to go so far, recognize that you're only willing to go so far and then find what makes you happy. That's what I've learned, I guess. Okay, and that sounds like an easy thing to do. Oh um, yeah, it's nothing nothing to it. <laughs> it. It's great looking back on it 25 years later, uh, but like you say, recognizing it in the moment can be a much more challenging thing because you don't want to see what's actually there. You want to yeah. see what you hope is there. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's not, that's not even a character flaw. You need that sort of relentless optimism to, to yeah. get you through a business that is so hard and so difficult to get into. And so, uh, I mean, I recognize that. I hope the kids in Mankato recognize it's an unforgiving business. It's really hard to get into. Um, and it sucks to be told that but you have to recognize that people are telling you that for a reason. Um, but it's, yeah, it's at the same time, it's easy for me to say now because I'm kind of on the other side of it. And uh, it's a cliche, but sometimes cliches are simply true. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. But if I can pass anything along, that's what I would pass along, I guess. Well, and it reminds me when, when you told that story about receiving the letter saying, uh, you said you were interested, where the heck are you? Kind of thing. <laughs> that, those, those meetings... I know under Paul Hustle still took place. 
he would always say that first meeting, whether it be with the student themselves or with the uh, student and their parents, is basically a, a meeting to determine, is this really what you're wanting to do and willing to do whatever yeah. is necessary to succeed? Yeah, I had, a, I had a friend of mine who shall remain nameless who went to Mankato briefly after I had already finished. And his reason, he had a conversation with Hustles. He got some feedback on a couple of projects that he did, acting things that he did. And he dropped out of Mankato before the, right at the end of the first quarter because oh. he was told things he didn't want to hear about himself. And like, well, it doesn't get any easier after this. So yeah. that's, the, that's the preparation that you have to have. So it's, in a weird way, it was probably, probably the best because he was not cut out for this for that business if you can't take that small sample of things so, and i hope you hope he has found what he is was destined to do i hope so too i hope so too i haven't talked to him in a good long time but i hope he has all right well thank you randy this has been a, a yeah thank you mike fun conversation it, it makes oh. me miss my first career out of uh, <laughs> college was working at a daily newspaper. Yeah. And, it's... and I like the, the way that things have evolved because I love to do this face to face. I mean, this without Zoom, would, we, would I be doing this right now? No. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. Well, you talk about the post COVID world and things that we've gotten to, to learn. This is one of them right here. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. So I thank you and I hope we'll uh, stay in touch as the years go on. And, and I wish you the best in your uh, college teaching preparation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. We said thank you enough times.